Pull that out. Okay, is that working? Can you uh, just uh, turn the, the microphone? Okay, no, it's still, still not working. You gotta mute. No. Hello, hello? Hello? Oh, yeah, that's working now. Okay. All the children, no, 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 don't touch. Uh, all the children come to the front if they haven't already, and uh, we'll start. Okay, so I've got some, uh, some chess pieces here, just for illustration. Um, who knows what this is? That's a pawn. Pawn, okay. And what, what about this one? That's a king, okay. So, all those pawns represent different kinds of people, okay? Some are better than others, but all are what? People. All are people, but all are also sinful. I mean, all people are sinful, but not all sinful people are equally sinful. I mean, some are worse than others. Is that right? Okay, well... I'll, I'll read to you a, a verse here in Isaiah, the, the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. And uh, <clears throat> the verse says this, All we, like sheep, who can, who can quote that? Exactly, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. But what does that mean? It means that everyone's doing his own thing, Right? No one's going God's way. Everyone's doing, going on his own way and doing his own thing. And uh, the Bible calls this sin, okay? And um, <clears throat> it can be represented like, a, like our, our righteousness, our sinfulness can be represented with one of those cups, okay? So that's, that's, that's what uh, we have done in our lives. That's the, the thoughts that we have thought. That's the words that we have spoken. That's all the, the, the uh, actions that we have done. God sees them all, and he sees them just like that over us. So help me out here. So if all that represents all of the human race, then tell me, what sins can we write on those cups? Do you know? Yes. Uh, Lying? Lying? Lying is a good one. Lying. <laughs> Any other? Benji, you had your hand up. You were going to say lying. Do you know? Do you know any other sin whatsoever? Is lying the big one? Yes. Disobedience. Okay, that's a good one. Okay. All right. So we put it on top of this person here. Okay. Yeah. Covetousness, wow, that's wow. a big one here. Yeah. I don't know if I can spell this. Covetousness, okay. All right, okay, another one. Yes. Hating. Hating. 
hitting, well, yeah, that's, a, that's definitely a, a sin, especially when it's done in the wrong way. Um, okay, we can, we can, we can say uh, unrighteous anger. Okay, so we put it on top of this person here. Uh, yes, Tiana. Selfishness. Selfishness. Wow, that's, that's very important. I mean, it's, it's a very bad thing, yeah. It's a very common thing. Selfishness. Hold on. I can't keep up. Yeah? Stealing. Stealing, wow. <laughs> Stealing. Okay. All right, two more. Someone else? Yes. Uh, being, not nice. being not nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know what 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 thing is that? <laughs> Wicked. Wickedness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wickedness. Okay. You see? Well, we said this one. We've got it here. But actually, you know, it, 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 all the, all those different people have different sins. Yes, Kyle. We already have hidden. That's yeah. Arrogance. Arrogance. Oh wow. Okay. Disobedience to parents. That's another one, right? Okay. I think that's that's enough for now. All right. So all people, God God sees from heaven all people like that. All their righteousness is is just like those cups. They can, he can he can see them. He can see the people, and he can see exactly what they've done. Okay. What's this? Uh, I can't even read my writing. <laughs> Covetousness, uh, disobedience, unrighteous anger. He looks at all the people. He sees them that way. And he, do you know, God is so holy and so righteous that he has to punish sin. Do you understand that? That, that is something that he has to do. Are you all following? Yeah? That's something that he has to do. But do you know what he did then? For people, sinful people, like all of, all of, those, all of those guys over here. Do you know what he did? He, he what? He put it all on himself. Well, he sent his son. God the Father sent his son into the world. And I, I've chosen the, what's that? The king, right? Because Jesus, whom he sent into the world, he's a king. And he brought him to the front over here. And he displayed him before all men. And you know what? The difference was that Jesus didn't have a sinful nature. And he never did any of those things. He was never covetous. He was never disobedient. He, was, he never had unrighteous anger. He was never selfish. He never, was, uh, he never stole anything. Never. And you know, God saw him with this kind of righteousness, like a crystal cup. That's not crystal, but imagine it. You know, every, it was just beautiful. It, isn't that much better than these cups? Yeah, it's... It's really nice. That's, that's how God saw him. He actually looked down from heaven and he said, This is my beloved son in whom is all my delight. Why? Because he was sinless. He was perfect. All of those people, like sheep, had gone astray. That includes us as well. And let me, let me continue reading here. It says, And the Lord, that's Yahweh the Father, laid on him, meaning on the Son, laid on him the iniquity of us all. He, you now he's talking about those people who are, who are God's people, who believe in Jesus. What does that mean? He laid on him the iniquity of us all. Doesn't anyone understand this? No. What does he mean? He, he put all the sins of his people on Jesus. So he took away on the cross. You understand what happened on the cross now? He took away that righteousness, that beautiful righteousness that Jesus had. And he put all of those mm. sinful actions and sinful thoughts on his son for all who were his people. Now, I'm going to leave those two out for a moment. Do you know why? Because those guys, they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't turn to him. They didn't, they didn't come to him as a savior. They said, no, we don't need that. Uh, we are happy with our lying. We are happy with our covetousness. That's fine. We don't need a savior. But all those other guys, they said, we need a savior. We need a savior. So I'm going to group them all here together. They say, we, we don't have a righteousness of our own. And do you know what God did on, on the cross? He put all their sins upon Jesus. That, remember, Jesus is underneath this, all the guilt of that sin underneath. And notice now what it says. 
And that's very important. Verse 10 of uh, Isaiah 53. In my Bible, it says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, that word bruise him, in other translations, it says crush him. In other, well, that word in other places in the Bible is actually translated as destroy. It is a very strong word. Okay? So, what happened on the cross? What happened on the cross was, yes. He died for our sins under the punishment uh, that our sins deserve, that the sins of those who trust in him deserve. Do you know what that means when it says it pleased the Lord to, cr to crush him? It, it means that God was, he satisfied the righteous demand. He, he was, he's a righteous judge. He cannot pardon those sinners here. Look at him. He cannot pardon. They have committed sins. So he has to punish their sins, but he punishes their sins <laughs> upon Jesus. Like that. He crushed him under the weight of that which we deserved. And he died. And then on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Now, can I have the, <laughs> the, piece, the piece again? Okay. So he rose again, triumphant over death. All those sins having been paid for now, there's no more reminder of sin and all those who trusted in him they are now with him like that, and they are covered in his righteousness. And now God sees them like that. And you know what? When one of those people stand before him on judgment day, God will see them with his righteousness. Nothing's wrong with that one. All their sins have been paid for. It's all done away with. It was finished. It's, it's done. What about those two? They didn't ask for forgiveness. They, they kept their own righteousness, right? They kept their own sinfulness upon themselves. And God, being the righteous judge, he has to punish them. And the Bible calls that hell. And it's, it's, a, it's a scary place, a dreadful place. It's the righteous judgment for sinners that, that sinners deserve. And so they will have to pay for their own sins throughout all eternity like that. And that is, that is not something that we would like to um, wish on anyone because there is a Savior. There is one who offered himself for us. And, and you can be clothed with his righteousness just like that. All right? Does it make sense? Yeah? So all of that happened on the cross. That's why the Lord Jesus came into the world. To save sinners like us. Okay? So whoever trusts in him, he is clothed in his righteousness like that. And he won't have to pun uh, pay for his own sins in hell. Okay, let's pray. Father, we are thankful that the gospel message is... A message that is understandable even by children. Lord, please save our little ones here. Have mercy upon them. May all who listen, Father, even in this room, be uh, those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness on that great day of judgment. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Okay. You're dismissed. Oh, before you actually go, uh, can I have your, um, uh, uh, your help here? Because today is Mother's Day. Okay? Well, that's uh, in this country you celebrate Mother's Day. And uh, so there are provided here lots of uh, flowers. So please, one, one child from each family, take the flowers back to your mom and congratulate her for being a mother. And, um, and once you've done that, can you help me uh, take, the, take the other flowers to some of the other ladies here, okay? Like you. Like you.
Okay. Yeah, you can, you can take your seats. Thanks, children, for all your help and attention. Um, so, apart from it being Mother's Day, what else ha is happening? Any, any notices, any uh, announcements, anything? What is it, the 10th of March? Is it always on the 10th of March? No? Is it only, always a certain Sunday of, of March? The first Sunday of March? Second Sunday of March, okay. Yeah, we, we don't really, we uh, in Eastern Europe, I say we, uh, have more, it's more like the 8th of March, that's the big uh, Women's Day slash Mother's Day event. And then, yeah, this one is not as big. I mean, that one is, doesn't exist really. <laughs> But um, when in Rome, do as Romans do, as they say. So, <clears throat> so yesterday you had the women's meeting, which went well. Yeah, I really um, mentioned that it went really well. And uh, you're going through a book now. So any women here who are interested in going to the women's meeting next time and who haven't been previously, uh, they can get in touch uh, with Rachel and um, she'll tell you what book you need to get. It's called The Disciplines of a Godly Woman. The men are going through the, the opposite, <laughs> Disciplines of a Godly Man. Uh, that's the book name. And uh, just to tell you in advance, so it's, there's not going to be a man's meeting next Saturday. That's the, the one that we are taking a break. But uh, the following Saturday, so two weeks from yesterday, there will be a men's meeting. And can you, if you're intending to come, Please read the whole of the second section, the soul section. That's four chapters, four chapters. They're not difficult to read, but it's, gonna, it's not going to be over the four chapters, but it's going to be uh, something, a mixture of, of some of them. So um, that's uh, the second uh, section, uh, which is on the soul, and uh, it's got four chapters. So please, men, read them if you can. Um, then this uh, coming Tuesday, there's a Tuesday Bible study or Q&A. Uh, at our house, you're welcome to come if you're able to, and if not, there's a, it's going to be on Zoom as usual. And um, then uh, Wednesday, there's the prayer meeting, again, usual place, um, 6.30. So the, the Tuesday Bible study is at 7 o'clock, the, the Wednesday prayer meeting is at 6.30. And um, <clears throat> then this Friday, because it's, there's nothing on Saturday, there's the singles uh, evening. Uh, and I, I, I don't like to call it singles, but you know what I mean. It's, it's open to anyone who's able to come to ours. Um, we, we watched uh, half of a documentary last time, uh, The Essential Church, and um, maybe we'll finish it this time. Maybe we'll watch something else. We'll probably watch something else. And um, yeah, so um, you're welcome to, to join us for that. And, um, <clears throat> and then next Saturday... Correct me if I'm wrong, but Sonny and Abed are going into Forest Bank Prison. Is that correct? Oh, Sunday. Sorry, that's, that's correct. Sunday. So we want to pray for them for that work. That's, when was the last time you were there? It was in November, October? Okay, so, yeah. And is it going to be once every, like, five months or so, or...? Oh, okay. How often is there a fifth Sunday in a month? Is that like... Right. Right, okay. I didn't know that. See, that's, a, that's an interesting fact. Yeah, so we want to pray for that. Jill, what about your um, testimony? Okay, so... No, no, yeah. And that's, for those who don't know, Jill's, uh, um, well, she has an open door to actually go into another prison in Manchester and share her testimony there. So, yeah, that's another opportunity that we want to pray for. Okay. Um, also, we, we want to keep on praying for those children there in Myanmar, and uh, it sounds like there was more trouble, more problems, more bombs falling. Uh, so, yeah, we want to continue praying for them. 
Did I miss anything out, Lawrence? Did you, I, sorry, you're sat all the way at the back and I need glasses. Is that a thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful that we are able to gather once again. We're thankful to be reminded of uh, the great transaction that took place on that cross. That's the reason we are here, Father. Otherwise, we would be like sheep that have gone astray, everyone gone into his own way and just uh, not, not have a thought for you, not, not want to follow you, not want to follow the great shepherd of the sheep. Father, we are, we are like that. We are slow. We are uh, so backward. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that you've done something, that you've brought us to him, that we have trusted him, that we have, uh, that we, we have had our sins laid upon him, that we have um, his righteousness clothed on us, and uh, that we can uh, one day, well, we can have hope and uh, anticipate the coming judgment. We, we, we don't have fear anymore, those of us who are in Christ. We're, that's a big thing, Father. And uh, we, we long uh, for his coming. That's, that's another thing. Father, we want uh, all those who do not have that joy and that hope here. Uh, we want them to have that hope with us. Uh, Father, please uh, save those who need salvation and, um, and correct those who need correction and do whatever is necessary, Lord, through your word this day. Bless our time together, our communion with one another, with you and uh, our singing. May all that bring you glory. Uh, Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I had asked uh, Emmanuel to share his testimony last week. Now, Marianne, can you share briefly your testimony? 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we'll do that before we take the Lord's Supper. For those of you who weren't here last week or, or need a reminder, um, Emmanuel and Marianne became members of the church last week, so that's why we're asking them to share their testimonies, uh, just so that we can all hear them and, and know them. So, and now I'm just realizing there were so many, but I'm thankful that I get the opportunity to share my testimony with the saints in church, and I'd like to start by reading from the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, that and bring it forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Yes, um, here Paul is writing to the to saints in Col uh, say the Colossians in Coloss, and he was thanking God for them for the day they heard of it. That's the gospel and truth, and so. Uh, when my husband shared Emmanuel, Emmanuel shared last Sunday, he said his salvation testimony is really the story of his life, which I believe it is. But I think if I share the story of my life, it probably wouldn't live. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you when and how I accepted the gospel of Christ in truth. So like most families um, from my side of Niger Nigeria, I was born in a Catholic home. Um, my father wasn't a staunch Catholic, but my mother was 
quite was my first exposure to Christianity because she was very apart from being Catholic, she was also under the charismatic renewal. So growing up, I had observed them um, carefully, and even as a kid, I knew who I didn't want to be like. So my dad, when we go to church, he'd always keep his his Bible in a Bible um, pouch and then put it inside a bag and take it to church. My mom would hold her Bible in her hands and walk on the street. And I watched the both of them and I knew I didn't want to be like my mom. It was very embarrassing because you could just put your Bible in the bag. You don't have to be too, you're not Jesus wife or mother. You're, you don't have to be too outgoing about it. And I saw my dad was always hiding his Bible, but it was when he got to the church, he would open it. And I thought, this is normal. And so I wanted to be more like my dad than my mom. But in my head, I loved Jesus and I wanted to, you know, be close to Jesus. But I wasn't really interested in him. And then if you know about Catholic, you know that there, there, there are certain kind of teachings, like there's heaven and then there's purgatory and then there's hell. So I and my siblings, I'm the second of four siblings, I and my siblings decided quite early that heaven might be impossible to make. I don't know what possessed us to think that, well, as heaven is quite difficult and we don't want to go to hell, let's try to make purgatory. And then from there, we'll work our way to heaven. And so we lived like this. Um, last Sunday, when Elder George was preaching, he said something that really struck um, my heart. Well, he said, um, he said, salvation doesn't come to people just because they are intelligent or because of eloquence, but it is by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And in my house, I'm kind of considered smart. So I think that's why amongst all of us, I was the last person to receive salvation in my house. So how did this happen? I received salvation on the 19th of July, 2009. And it was a very, it was it's the most extraordinary thrilling thing that has happened in my life. Um, while we were still in Catholic, my mom quickly realized that something was wrong and she couldn't keep up with the teachings and she knew that we need to leave the Catholic church. So we moved to a more rural area from the from where we're living in the city and moved to a rural area. And we started attending a redeemed church, a Pentecostal church. Close by because she couldn't keep up. She couldn't stay in a place where she didn't believe what they were saying anymore. But my dad kept going to Catholic. But surprisingly, one day my dad came home with a flyer and he said he met some Asians, some Koreans, and they were preaching to him. And he found it really funny and we discussed it and we just laughed because how could Koreans know about um, the gospel? What do they know? Are they not Buddhist or something? But my mom was interested. And so somehow my dad um, invited them over to our house. Now when they came that day, I, I just returned from school. And then I and my siblings, um, we heard them before they got there because all the children on the streets were following them, shouting, J.S. Park, J.S. Park, because it was a Korean. And so we knew they were coming to our house, and that kind of, you know, it was fascinating for them. So when they came and they preached to my family, they preached the story of Jacob and Esau like we've never heard before. And they preached this story relating it to salvation. Because, I mean, most people understand Jacob to be a deceiver and a cheat. This is what we understand. But somehow God calls himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So why would God call himself the God of someone who is a cheat? And then he explains it to us um, in relation to salvation, like Rebecca was representing Jesus, and Jacob was representing those who did not achieve salvation by their works or their efforts. Esau was strong, and he, could have, he was trying to work out salvation for himself. But Rebecca already knows the heart of the father, Isaac, which is Jesus who knows the heart of God and is the only one that can bring us before God um, and present us to God like Rebecca did with Jacob and Isaac. It was weird to me. I thought, I, mean, I saw my siblings, they were so happy to listen. I thought, ah, oh, you're fascinated by a white man because we don't see white people in our area. So I thought, this is why you're fascinated. And I couldn't 
listening to what they, I was hearing what they were saying and I wasn't processing what they were saying because I just thought everyone was, be, was just excited because there's a Korean, a white person in our house. And so I wasn't listening to them. So, but my siblings were excited and then they left, they tried to con convince me, they tried to talk to me about it. And I told them, you know, you're just excited about this. Don't, after one week, your excitement will die down and we'll go back to working our way towards purgatory because that's where we're going anyway. So, but one day I stole something from my mom and I was very convinced that she wasn't going to find out because it was a full house. And then um, everybody like looked at me like the good, good girl kind of image. But as soon as my mom got there, the first name she called was my name. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say my name. My name is Ugo Chuku Marianne Matthias. So she called out my name immediately, come here. And then I went very confident because she couldn't possibly suspect me. And then she asked me, did you take this from here? I said, no, me, I could never. I began to cry because I thought I could, come, I, I could prove to her that I didn't. But I could have just stopped her crying. But I went even further, and picked her Bible. I told her, I swear I didn't take it. And so my dad got angry. Why are you making this girl go through so much torture? Why are you asking her? Why do you keep asking her? There are so many people in this house. Anyone could have done it. And at that moment, I knew it was a sin, but I had not been counting the other sins we'd been doing while growing, we'd been committing while growing up, lying, little stealing here and there. I didn't think that, well, I just thought that that could get us to purgatory. It wouldn't get us to hell anyway. It wasn't so bad. But that day, after doing all of that, my mom calmed down with me and then, she just said, all right, no problem. But later in the evening, she called me, and in a very sweet voice, she asked me again, you know I love you, and I'm not going to tell your dad. I promise you I'm not going to say anything. You just tell me, did you take it? At that moment, I told her, yes, I did. I said, okay, I'm going to get a cup of water. The cup of water was to go and tell my dad, who then called me, and he wasn't just angry. He was really shocked and hurt because he thought he was raising I mean, even though he was not very Christian, he thought he was raising good children with good morals and disciplined children. But one has just told him, not just told him, swore with the Bible because she wanted to escape. Of course, I got the beating of my life, but that was not where it ended. The beating wasn't um, the main point. It was my cousin who came to me and told me, because I had tried to pin it on her, actually. I was kind of pointing them towards that direction. So my cousin came and told me, look, you have not just committed a small sin. You stole, you lied, and you swore. You broke three commandments at once. You're not making purgatory. You're going to hell. Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me, hey, all these sins I've been committing, and then this one, there is no way I'm going to escape hell. I was really, I was really young. I was like 11. But I knew what, what she was saying. I felt it that what she was saying was true. And I thought that God is definitely going to find a way to punish me. So with my heavy heart, if, after crying and uh, taking the beating, and my dad was disappointed, really, I had to beg them for forgiveness. But I wasn't OK, because I had just heard that I was definitely going to hell. I was not going to make purgatory. It means my siblings were going to go ahead, and I would go to hell while they worked their way to heaven. So I thought, oh, this is going to be hard. Two years later, my mom passed away. And somehow I became very angry because I thought that was the punishment that God was giving me. And I, I feel like most times we need to be careful what we like, tell children because that time my cousin kept, she didn't tell me directly, but she said, you see what I told you, you see what I told you. And there was so much guilt in my heart, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't angry that, you know, I was angry because I thought, but my mom is saved. She received salvation. Why did you have to take her away from me? Why didn't you just punish me? I mean, I'm the one who was you're supposed to go to hell, so why didn't you just punish me? And I was so angry. So like my mom died on the 19th of April, 2009. On the 20th of April, we moved into these Korean missionaries um, place, the mission house, mission building. And so I, I was really, really angry. I was rebellious and everything. So on that 19th of July, 
I had decided to take a long trip to speak with God one-on-one um, -on -one and ask God serious questions. Why did you have to take my mom? Why didn't you just leave her? She was saved. I mean, there's four of us. If you take me, they would, they would cry, but they'll be okay. But you took her, and now all of us have to bear it. And, and I'm feeling bad because I think this is not the end of the punishment because I swore using the Bible. So I decided then that I wanted to, I just, I just wanted to go. So I picked, I gathered together um, leftover medication in my house and put them together. And I wanted to take them at once and just go. And I knew, I, I figured out the right time to do it. It was like 7.30. But in the missionary house, um, there's routine. There are rules. So I figured, like, at the time I was ready, nobody was going to come and interrupt my trip. So it was like, they have, we the, wake up by 5 a.m., exercise till 5.30, 5.30 till 6 o'clock is morning devotion, 6 o'clock to 7, it's reading Bible, 7 is breakfast till 7.30, and then 8 o'clock is prayer time till 12. 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock is prayer time, then there's a mission class where they study from 9.30 to 12, and then there's a rest time. It's not really rest time, but it's leisure to learn piano, guitar, taekwondo, languages, anything. And then there is 2 p.m. to 5.30 where we go out for, out, where they go out for outreach to go and preach to souls. And then 6 p.m. dinner. So 7 till 10 is for reading Bible. So lights out by 10.30. So I believed by that 7 to 10 was the best time to carry out my plan. But a sister came to look for me at that time, that very time where I decided I was in tears, I was in that dark room, and I thought, I'm ready to go. And then she came and saw me <laughs> with different pills on the floor. And she asked me, Kochi, what are you doing? And I thought, why are you here? <laughs> You're supposed to be reading the Bible. You've just caught me. So she said, come out, I need to talk to you. And I didn't want to go, but anyway, you can't stop me. When, when you're done saying what you want to say, I would come back and do what I want to do. So she called me and my, young, my last sister. My last sister even received salvation before I did. So she called both of us and asked us to sit for fellowship. And then she asked me, are you righteous or you're a sinner? And I thought that was a weird question. I'm living in the missionary house. Of course, I will be righteous. Everybody here is righteous. Would I be the exception? So I said, yes, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. She was looking at me. I know what you were about to do, but you just said you're righteous. I didn't look at her in the aisle. I was going to be rebellious anyway. I said, of course, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. And then she asked, she asked a second question. If you died tonight, I knew what you were about to do. If you had died tonight, where would you go to? There are some questions that you just can't lie about. And so when she asked me that question, I couldn't just respond because I wanted her to stop. I, saw my, I heard myself saying, I'm, I would have gone to hell. And then she said, but you're righteous. How would you go to hell? And then I had nothing to say. And then it was like God shut my mouth that period because I was guilty. And then she opened the words and she began to preach to me. She talked to me about sin right from the fall of Adam. And she spoke about how I did not inherit sin, but I was already born in sin. Just the way I didn't choose my name, I didn't choose the family I, I, was, I was born into. I was already born in sin, so I came with sin. It was not, I was trying to tell her about the sin I had committed that was weighing on my heart, but she told me that was not the sin that God was going to judge me by. And then she explained to me through the story of Adam about how sinful I am, how sin entered into the world and death came to all men because all had sinned. And it was like I was hearing it again for the first, I was, I was hearing it for the, it was just very different to me that night. And she kept asking me, even though I'd already told her I was going to hell, she asked me again, do you think you're good or you're bad? And I told her, well, I'm like 80% good. 20% bad, just because of what she had seen. And then she told me, by what standards? Are you good or bad? And I said, by God's stand, God standard, of course. And then she told me, do you know what God's standard is? I said, yes, the Ten Commandments. 
and she shocked me. She said, there are 613 laws in the Bible. She showed me James chapter 2 verse 10. You break one, you break all. And it didn't make sense to me. In school, when I, when I score 9 over 10, I'm brilliant. I'm a genius. But with God, when I score 9 and a half over 10, it's zero because it's, it's not, it's not what's, it's, what is required. So when she told me that, I, 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 was, I didn't know what to say anymore. And then she kept asking me, so how do you want to get to God? How do you want to go to heaven if you're like this? If you're 100% evil? You know, when you're swamped, I don't know if anyone has fallen into a swamp before, but I have. When you're swamped up to your ankle, you can come out of the swamp. When you're swamped up to your knee, you can try to come out. But what happens when you're swamped up to your hip? Then you need help. But at this point, I was swamped up to my hip. I was swamped up to my neck because there was nothing I could do. I couldn't keep the law. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything about my sin because I was thinking of one sin, but there are more than there are 613 sins. There were a lot of sins. In fact, me sitting there, I was committing sin already. There, right there. I had lied to her. I said I was, going, I was righteous, but I wasn't. So I was now swamped up to my neck and then I, I, needed, I needed help. I needed a savior to come out. And then she shared this word with me and she showed me from 1 Corinthians. Um, six. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, me, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And she stopped there and looked at me and said, which of them are you? I could not say I was just the thief because I was, I was all of them. And then she went on. 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It was like the pot cold water on my head because I didn't understand. And then I didn't understand why Jesus Christ had to bear my sin. I mean, fetch a child of five and ask them, who is Jesus? And they'll tell you he came to, to save the world from what? From sin. I mean, I was literally thinking that when, when Elder George asked a child and they said he came to die for our sins, I was literally thinking that. But saying it doesn't mean that it is believed. So when she said this to me, I asked her, she, she explained through you know, the sin offering in Deuteronomy, how the priest would lay his head on the hand of the, the his hands on the head of the goats and transfer the sins of the Israelites to them and then they are sent into the wilderness and they are killed and she showed me the same example in John um, during the baptism how John had to lay his hand on the head of Jesus and transfer the sin of the world to Jesus Christ so Jesus at that moment bore our sins from the past to the future and so she explained to me do you realize that your sin is inside the, the sin that Jesus Christ took away and it, it, was, it was shocking. Because here now, she explained to me that this salvation, this gift from God, is not based by anything I try to do. It's not based by what I, commandments I try to keep, or efforts, or by striving, but by Jesus Christ himself. And then here, like I said, like I read in verse 11, it says, you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. So it means me being saved from the bondage of sin is not based on anything I do, but by the Spirit of God. So Jesus Christ, God, is literally the guarantee of my salvation. And I, was, I, couldn't, believe, I couldn't believe what she was saying. It felt like I was hearing words for the first time. It felt like I was seeing colors for the first time. It felt like I was seeing things. I remember when we watched the... Um, documentary on the girls from Kathmandu, Nepal, and 
the girl was testifying and there was a light in her eyes. She, she's probably 13, around that age. And I could, I was, I was sitting back there and I was crying because I was around the same age. And I heard the same things from other people. Oh, we have changed because that was after then. Because that night, what I heard was really strange to me. And then sometimes when we hear, once one hears the gospel, sometimes they're not sure. Maybe you hear it today and then tomorrow you think, what happened yesterday? Was it a dream? I was like that. But she showed me, I'm sorry, this is the last one. I'm so sorry, I'm taking so much time. In Hebrews, um, Hebrews 10. First Hebrews 10.10. 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, who once for all. And 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. 17, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, I was aiming for purgatory. I was aiming, we were aiming collectively for purgatory by our own efforts, by our own works. But here I am, I was there that night hearing that, what Jesus has done for me. I'm not going to have to pass through purgatory, but he has brought me into the holiest, into heaven, into his space. And I had nothing to do with it. Human beings are very, we, we tend to love achievements. We are happy with when we do something and we get something. But here, I had nothing to do with it. I cannot boast and say, oh, I did this and then God blessed me. Or I did this and then I went to heaven. Or I did this and then God had mercy on me. I, had, I have none of that. I had none of that. So it was pure grace. So that night, she prayed together with me and I prayed. Usually there was a pattern of prayer that I used to have before I heard the gospel, before I received salvation. I was like, thank you, Lord, for this. Lord, I'm asking you for forgiveness for this. Lord, I ask you for this. I cover my life with the blood of Jesus, and I don't even know what I'm praying about. But that night was different. I was, it felt like I was communicating with my father. There was no barrier of sin in my heart. There was no um, bondage. There was no guilt, no condemnation. And then when I prayed to God that night, I knew. It just, I understood that I had no life to give because sometimes we say we're giving our lives to Christ. But I understood that night that because of sin and death had already spread, there was really no life to give, but there is now a life to receive. And at that night, I was able to receive it. So that day is very particular in my head. That's the 19th of, of July, 2009, and that was the day I got saved. Eventually, in 2013, I got baptized. Actually, I could have been baptized before then, but I was scared because I do not know how to swim. And we never used a pool like we use here. We had to go to the river. So I did not know how to swim, to swim but on the day I got baptized, so it was really, was really wonderful to be part of the body of Christ. It's one thing to just say, oh, I'm born again, but to understand that you have partaken in what Christ did on the cross and through resurrection is another thing entirely. And from that time, I could see how my life was really, became really different. And I could see how precious I am to God. So coming to how we came here, because I know my husband wasn't able to talk about it. Um, can I say, can I talk about how we came to church? I think, I think uh, we are kind of running out here. Oh, okay. Anyway, I've already shared with, with Pastor George about how we came to church, but I'm, I'm willing to share with anyone who wants to hear our testimony. Thank you so much for listening to me. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sister. Okay, can uh, a few brothers uh, um, help me out with the um, distribution of the Lord's Supper? And um, <clears throat> if you, uh, you know, you heard that those verses in 1 Corinthians 6, if you can identify us as such were some of us, as you were one of them, one of those people, then you can take of this bread and of this cup.
Well, we uh, know from the scriptures that the bread represents Christ's body, he said, which is given for you, and the cup, the cup of the new covenant, represents his blood, which was shed for us. And um, as our sister was saying just now, you know, that, uh, that uh, connection there between uh, the Old Testament offerings and sacrifices where, where on, those, on those goat, the scapegoat, the, uh, the high priest would, uh, would put his hand and uh, would confess the sins of the people and then, you know, take that all the way to the New Testament. And, um, yeah, even though John the Baptist didn't, wasn't that high priest that did that, he pointed to Christ and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the, the world. And that sin would be, would be put on him, as, as we were telling the children earlier, on the cross. That's where he would pay the ultimate price. I mean, it wasn't even before the cross. It wasn't even, some people think of Gethsemane. But even in Gethsemane, there was a helper. You remember, there was an angel strengthening him, even when his, when, when his uh, sweat was turning into blood. And, um, and later on, on his way to the cross, there was another helper, Simon the Cyrenian. Do you remember him? He was carrying the cross of Jesus. He was helping him. But when he got to the cross, there was no helper. No man, no angel. He even didn't take of the of the drink that they were offering the, those who would be crucified, which would in some way uh, kind of ease the pain of, of crucifixion. He didn't take any of that. There was no help whatsoever. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree by himself without a helper, and that's why we, praise the Lord, we can aim for higher than purgatory. There's no purgatory, by the way, but uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the problem with man-made religion. Man-made religion thinks that we are better than we are, and it thinks less of Christ than he is. He is, he is better than, than, than that. He, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's only a heaven and a hell, really. And uh, so we deserve the hell, and he deserves the heaven. And because of him, we can go to heaven. It's as simple as that. So we do this in remembrance of him. Father, we are thankful that <clears throat> you sent your Son into the world to be the Savior of sinners, that he was identified even by that, we, we might say, the last of the Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist. He, would, he was there. He could point at him and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, the one that all the, the prophets before him foretold, the one about, all, about whom they spoke, and about whom they prophesied all those centuries prior to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was that privileged man to be able to, privileged prophet, to be able to appoint literally to a man standing before him and say, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. N not, not a physical lamb anymore, not a physical uh, bull or any other animal that would have uh, been slaughtered there on those altars throughout the centuries, but an actual man the summation of all the offerings, the, the, the fulfillment of everything. We're thankful, Father, that he truly did go to that altar and who truly did sacrifice himself, did truly was uh, that lamb. And even now we read that uh, in heaven there is, uh, uh, there is a lamb freshly slain. He, he appears as such. He, that sacrifice is never forgotten. All who, are, all who make it to heaven because of him never forget how they got there. Father, we are thankful for him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In his name, amen.
rising scene.
Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, and we'll read. In chapter 2, from verse 17, down to the end of the chapter, and through into chapter 3, the first five verses. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left alone in Athens and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For, in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that uh, this ancient foe of whom we've been singing, uh, we know that he is, uh, he is uh, alive and well in this world, but yes, perhaps even in some way, through his influence, through his minions. Uh, he might be present even here with us. Allow it, Lord, that your word would not be hindered today, that uh, there would be no tempter tempting here in any way, shape, or form, that the word of God might dwell richly in every single heart, and that there would be no evil birds trying to pluck the seed out of those hearts that have not received it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we'll only be looking at those uh, last few verses of that chapter, of chapter 2. But I wanted, for the sake of context, for us to actually read into chapter 3, because the two are very much connected. As you know, Paul, Silas, and Timothy had to, well, cut their stay in Thessalonica short, or... More accurately, they were kicked out of Thessalonica by those Jews that didn't believe the gospel. Uh, they, 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 we, we saw that last week. They, just, they were uh, 
antagonistic towards the gospel. They, they didn't like the message, and they didn't want Paul preaching it. They didn't want Paul preaching it in Thessalonica. They don't, didn't want Paul preaching it in Berea either. And so they would actually follow him, rent mobs, and make sure that there, that there is a big calamity following him everywhere so that he cannot preach the gospel. So um, we read of that in Acts 17, by the way, and I'll just... Uh, remind you of, of the context of, uh, in which uh, this was all happening. Acts 17, verses 5 through 9, tell us about how Paul and Silas and Timothy were essentially uh, driven out of Thessalonica. It says, but the Jews who were not persuaded, remember he for three Sabbaths was engaging with them in the synagogue. He was sharing the gospel with them. She, he was uh, explaining to them that this Jesus is actually the Messiah, the awaited one, the anointed one. And so some were persuaded, others weren't. And those who weren't persuaded, becoming envious, there we have it, that's sin, <laughs> envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Now, Jason is one of those who had believed and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, meaning they did not find Paul and Silas and Timothy um, <clears throat> among them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is, no, there is another king, Jesus. Now that's, that's the, the message, and that's what uh, has turned the world upside down, apparently. And uh, they troubled, and they troubled the crowd, it says, and the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, so when they had taken, and that's the key uh, phrase here, when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy had already left. They had, had to flee in the night. And, uh, and they brought Jason and some of the other believers in front of those uh, magistrates, in front of those uh, rulers of the city, and they took security from them. And we don't know exactly what that security was. It, it was a kind of a guarantee making sure that if you in any way, shape, or form uh, again um, bring Paul back into the city, you're going to be in trouble. I mean, it could have been a monetary thing. It could have been like that they would have to pay a fine or that they had to pay a, a guarantee which would be kept with the rulers to make sure that Paul doesn't come back. Or it might have been even, uh, uh, you know, uh, jeopardizing their own freedom, their own liberty uh, in a way so that uh, if Paul was ever to be found uh, back in Thessalonica, Jason would go to prison as well as Paul. So it could have been uh, either one of those things or perhaps even both. But Paul here wants to remind them. He, he wants to remind those believers of the pain he had when he left them and the subsequent desire that he had to visit them again. He says in verse 17, the beginning, but we brethren having been taken away from you. Now this, uh, that I'm reading from the New King James and Taken away is really a weak translation. Uh, the word here, and I'm no Greek scholar, but I, and I, I know that you probably don't know that much Greek either, but I think we can all understand the word in the Greek because it has an equivalent word in the English. So he uses the word aporphanizo. So let me, let me break it down, and you'll, you'll figure out what it, what it says. Ap orphan itso. Orphan. We are orphaned. We were orphaned from you, he says. Uh, that's the only usage in the scriptures, by the way, of that word. And he uses it as if to say that they, the parents, were bereaved of their children. That's, that's essentially how, how he is describing this situation. He's not just saying, oh, we had to leave, or we, were, uh, we had to cut our stay with you short. No, he says, we were torn from you. A violent term. And so... Uh, that's, that's how he's describing this, this uh, departure from Thessalonica. It wasn't Paul's idea. If he had any, if he could make it there, he would be there in a heartbeat. That's what he's saying, essentially. And he's extending that familial imagery that he began, remember, in the beginning of chapter 2, verses 7, when he, when he was saying to them that we were gentle among you as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. That's how Paul was describing the relationship between them, the apostles, and the believers of, of this young church in Thessalonica. Or verse 11, you know how we exhorted and comforted and 
charged every one of you as a father does his own children. So you see, and then now he's saying, not just as a mother and father, now he's saying we have been, we have been cut off, taken away from our own very own children. And so now he, he wants to show them that this, is, this was not, you know, perhaps, you know, there were some accusations going on there. I mean, we, we looked at that, the first 12 verses of chapter 2. Uh, there were some accusations against Paul and, and his, um, uh, his brethren there, fellow, uh, fellow brethren, fellow workers, the um, Silas and Timothy. There were some accusations against them in, in different directions, and perhaps this was one of them. Perhaps they were accusing them that, look at them. When it got tough, they left, and they, they are not even thinking about coming back anymore. Now, maybe someone was slandering Paul and Silas in that way. And so Paul wants to make sure that they understand this is, this is far from the truth. Uh, I mean, he says, look at all those qualifiers. Look at how, look at the words here. Endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. I mean, who speaks like that? He reveals his affections for them. And that's how it should be. Any leader worth his salt should have aff affections for the people that he's trying to lead. And that he's, especially if he was instrumental in their salvation. I mean, that's, that just goes without saying. That's the love of God working through him. And so, and then he goes on to say that he was eager, what? To see your face. That he, he wanted to see them again in person. It wasn't just that, well, yeah, I guess um, we want to we wanna make sure that you're doing okay, so we'll send Timothy. No, that was the last resort, Okay. There was, they were trying to get back to them and over and over and over and they couldn't. As we will find out later, Satan hindered them. And uh, it was Timothy was the last resort. Okay, at least Timothy can go. Okay? And it, wouldn't, it wasn't even crossing Paul's mind at first to write a letter to them. That wasn't, that was, he knew that that's not the same as a physical presence there. And, and that's, that ought to tell us something because, you know, it's not the same uh, to be present here and to be present online or on a Zoom call. It wasn't enough. Uh, and so Paul didn't just resort to writing a letter and, okay, well, someone else will send, will send the letter to them and they'll be okay. No, he recognized that his physical presence there was necessary for this young church. And so that's why he's so grieved and hurt. But after Timothy comes back from that visit and hearing that good report, Paul is just beside himself. He's over the moon in, in a good way, right? So he's, he's, uh, uh, he, he writes this letter to them because he wants to share uh, in the joy of, of the fact that they are standing firm. And so <clears throat> that's, uh, that's why uh, he, he writes First Thessalonians and comforts them in this letter. He reminds them of the fact that they were taken away indeed and not actually, uh, they didn't leave by their own desire, by their own volition. Uh, he also tells them that he hopes that this is just for a short time. I mean, that's what they were hoping for. In reality, it will be something around five years before he ever sees them again in person. You can read about that in, the, in Paul's third missionary journey in Acts 20, the beginning verses of Acts 20. So, yes, he, he, intended, it, he intended that, uh, that uh, separation to be only for a short time, but actually it was for longer than he anticipated. But he wants to nonetheless comfort them. He wants to tell them that, yes, they are out of sight, but they are not out of mind. They rem remember them constantly, daily, day and night, actually. And, and that's consistent with the rest of the epistle. Just remember what we read in uh, chapter 1, verse 2, for example. We give thanks to God always for you, for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. So they pray for them. They're always remembering them. Remember, verse 3, remembering without ceasing. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13, thank God without, we thank God without ceasing, again, on account of their reception of the gospel. Even, even later in chapter 3, verse 10, he would say, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect that which is lacking in your, in your faith. So Paul is he's just going out of the way to establish that reality, that fact in their minds that they are longing for them. They are missing them. They want to see them. They want to, to impart something, uh, something spiritual to them when they are physically with them there. It's not just a nice thing to say. He was being serious. Okay, so that's, that shows you something of the heart of Paul, but it also tells you something about how we ought to be. 
And uh, and verse 18, he goes on. Uh, he continues explaining his absence or their absence from them and says, therefore, we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and again, it's almost as if he says, this is not just like our missionary organization was uh, wanting to send us back, so to speak. I personally, Paul, was interested in you so much that I wanted again and again, I tried, I made attempts to come back to you. But there was a reason. It wasn't a one-off try. It wasn't a one-off attempt. But there was a reason why he couldn't go back to them, why they couldn't go back to them, Paul and Silas. Well, verse 18, uh, the, sec the second part of that verse, but Satan hindered us. Now, that's an interesting expression, isn't it? And that's where I want to focus our attention this afternoon uh, because this, is, this reveals to us something about the spiritual nature of ministry, of, of the Great Commission. This is not simply, okay, printing out leaflets and giving them out to people and uh, convincing them intellectually that, they have to, that, that Christianity makes more sense than Islam. That's not, that doesn't even scratch the surface. There is a spiritual warfare going on. Uh, and it, it's going on here right now, even though you don't see it. On the surface, everything is still under the surface. In the spiritual world, things are not s still at all. Even in this room, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not seeing it, but, you know, uh, God can, give, can lift the veil sometimes and show you things like that. And uh, I, I remember after I was saved, I went back home to Bulgaria, and I shared the gospel with a few of my closest friends, and... Uh, I invited them again and again and again to come to the, the meetings of the church. And they, some of them, they were very interested, by the way. They, they, they were not, they didn't just laugh, laugh at me and mock me and just go their way and, and have nothing to do with me. They were interested in, in what I had to say. They, they are all what you might call nominal Christians. Or at least they, they are interested in, in, they believe that there is a God. Oh, no, none of them would deny that. And... I, Specifically, two of them had promised me. I mean, they went out of their way to promise me on at least four occasions that they would come to the meetings, and they never did. Something always happened just in the last moment. I'm like, I, I, I'm driving the car. I'm in front of, I'm, I'll call them. I'm in front of you. Come down. I'll pick you up, and we're going. Oh, sorry, this happened, and that happened. I, I can't make it. Sorry. And that happened not once or twice. That happened at least four times. And we were sat there in a coffee shop with them once, and I'm like saying to them, uh, you know, there, there's a real devil uh, out there who, who uh, wants... I, I was wanting to communicate to them the reality that that might be the enemy stopping them from hearing the gospel. And uh, they looked at me as if I had just said, like, a, a they weren't sure whether I was joking or not. Now, those guys, they would never deny that, that God exists, for example. But when I seriously suggested that the devil might be stopping them from coming to church... They were, they, they were laughing at it, not, not mocking me, but because they thought that, that that was unbelievable to them. They couldn't even comprehend it. Uh, the devil stopped stopping me from going to church. No, it was just some circumstance. Something happened. It's okay. It's not a big deal. The devil didn't come stopping us. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's what it is like. It, people don't believe <laughs> that there is a real enemy out there. And sometimes, sadly, even Christians don't believe. But Paul does. He says Satan. He, he uses the Hebrew transliteration into the Greek of the word Satan, which means adversary. I mean, that's, uh, uh, he's known by different names in the scriptures, and especially in Paul's writings. He calls him later on, we read that in, in chapter 3, the tempter. Uh, but in other places in, in Paul's epistles, he says, for example, 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, the evil one, or 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world, or Ephesians 2.2, the prince of the power of the air. He goes by different names, but he does believe in a, in a real personal devil, This uh, Paul does. And um, he thought it's so important to, for them to know about this personal devil, <laughs> Satan, that he actually, whilst he was there with them for what, just a matter of a few weeks, he actually taught them something about him. He didn't expect when he wrote this epistle, when they got to the word Satan, for them to scratch their heads and wonder, who is that now? Is that one of the Jews? Is that one of the... Who, is that someone in Corinth? Who, who's Satan? No, he expected them to know. He, he thought it's, it's worthwhile teaching them about the adversary of the church. 
the adversary of God, our ancient foe. It's worth teaching, teaching them. So he didn't wait till they were, I don't know, in their second year of uh, some theology uh, course uh, and doing a module on demonology before they ever hear about Satan. No, they, he taught them about Satan early on. Why? Not so that he exalts him, but because they are in a spiritual warfare. They're on the battlefield. They ought to know who they are fighting with. And so, whatever the actual hindrance was, we don't know. We can speculate. We can just uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, a few ideas of what this hindrance might have looked like, but we, we don't know. But what, one thing is certain, that Paul believed that they, this was not just a mere accident or coincidence. This was premeditated, deliberate act of the adversary. And that's how he, he, how he saw it. And so, could it have been that... Uh, that uh, he, he made it all the way to Corinth and there were problems in the church at Corinth that he couldn't leave behind and that he had to stay there. It required his, his presence there. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, some division or some, some, something, some strife, something like that. Who knows? That's one of the possibilities. Another possibility is that they, you know, they just couldn't go back because of all the opposition that was uh, raised by the Jews in every place, in Berea, in Thessalonica. So they couldn't make it back to them in a way which would be safe for the young believers. That's, that's another possibility. But really, we're only speculating. It could be something else. One thing is certain. The great enemy of the church, the great enemy of Christians, does not want them to meet. Isn't that something that you can find in that, in, in that passage? He doesn't want Paul and Silas to go back to those young believers. He doesn't want them to be physically present. He hindered that. Why? Because he doesn't want them to be there. He doesn't want them to meet. And that's, that's uh, something that we can take away because he hasn't changed his tactics. And if he, if he thought it was detrimental to his own cause, the Satan, that Christians meet and that Paul and Silas make it all the way back to Thessalonica and actually have fellowship with them there, if he thought it detrimental to his cause back then, be sure that he thinks it detrimental to his cause even now. He doesn't want Christian. He doesn't want this gathering. This is one thing Satan doesn't want. I don't know about everything, but I know about this one thing. He doesn't want Christians to meet. You can count on it. He wants to prevent them from gathering. <clears throat> Yeah, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't change. You know, we change. His, the, the objects of his, of his wrath, of his temptations change. People come and go all the time, but he, is, he remains the same. He is this ancient foe. He is the adversary. He, is the, he has been the same since the garden. He hasn't changed his mind since then. The tactics are still the same, so we can, we can do well if we learn from, from what we see here in Scripture. <clears throat> Do you not think that Satan is thrilled when uh, our guys go down in town to preach the gospel? Don't think that he's like, oh, okay, I'm not going to even try hindering them. You know, it's like preaching the gospel in town every Saturday, ah, it's no, no big deal. Be sure that he tries to hinder that. Be sure that, you know, if he, if he doesn't put a hundred difficulties and hindrances in the way, so that you don't make it actually to the evangelism. He will raise you know, some kind of opposition there so that, so that people are distracted. Or he'll send his guys out there so that there's no free spot for our guys to preach the true gospel. Or he'll just flood the whole you know, Market Street or the whole Manchester Town Center with all sorts of different so-called... You know, street preachers and everything else, that people are just left confused and hardened because they just hear so many different things all at once. Yeah, they might hear the true gospel, but he has flooded the market. He has flooded literally the whole thing with, with tens and ten, tens and, uh, and, and, and scores of, of other kinds of messages. If it's not the Muslims, it's going to be uh, the, the Hindus. If it's not the Hindus, it's going to be some other kind of, uh, of gospel, so-called gospel. Yeah, so <clears throat> he's not happy about what's happening there. He's not going to happily give, his, uh, uh, give away his, uh, uh, his possessions. You know, he, <laughs> he's not going to let you just 
happily shine the gospel light into the minds of those whom he has blinded. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let you plunder his goods unless he's tied down. He's a strong man, according to Scripture, if you remember. And you are not the stronger man. The Spirit of God is. That's the previous verse. The Spirit of God is. And that's why you need to pray that the Spirit of God assists you when you go out, when you come in, when you do anything. Why? Because, because he's the stronger man. He's the one who can bind the strong man. On earth, he's not his equal. Remember what we sang? So you're not his equal. You need someone stronger than, he, than you and than him in order to actually prevail against him. And the moment you set your mind to pray, you're already, you're already uh, in spiritual warfare. You're all, that, that is spiritual warfare. That's not, something, that's not just something that uh, religious people do. That is spiritual warfare. <clears throat> so just observe here with me for a moment Paul's spiritual mindedness. This is not some weak, uh, faithless believer that, that says Satan hindered us. Well, it's just uh, writing off any difficulty to the devil, you know, to the devil's work, attributing anything that goes wrong to the devil. No, this is Paul the Apostle. So he knows, we can assume he knows what he's talking about. He doesn't just throw around words like that randomly. <clears throat> Paul understood that there was a co cosmic battleground and he was engaged in spiritual warfare. I mean, you know the verses, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is unlikely that the hindrance was Satan physically appearing in some bodily form to, to Paul and trying to stop him physically from going down or up that path leading back to Thessalonica. He obstructed Paul's way in some other way that if you were, uh, if you were unaware uh, and just looking uh, like an observer on the side, you would say, well, this was just a coincidence. This was just an accident. Maybe this was just not... I mean, but Paul saw through it. He was looking, looking for uh, the, uh, the devil's hoof prints, if I may say that, in, in everything that was happening around him. He, could know, he, he was not ignorant to his devices. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, you, you, you ascribe every problem in your life to the devil. You know, that's, not, that's not how Paul um, does it. And if you read you know, all, all of the epistles consistently, you'll see that he is very careful when he brings up all of that. He doesn't bring it up just lightly. He doesn't bring it up on every, every corner. But... That's, that's something that, is even, that was there even in our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when he uh, was set to go to the cross, set to go to Jerusalem, and Peter was, uh, you know, Mr. Know-it-all, and all of a sudden, you know, he was, he was uh, buffeted because he said, said the right answer when, when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's right. That, that's right, Peter. But flesh and blood did not reveal to you that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And the very next moment, Jesus is telling them how he's going to the cross. And, and Peter's like, no, 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 no. Hold on, you're not going anywhere. And, uh, and Jesus saw the work of Satan in the words of one of his closest disciples. Get behind me, Satan. See, the problem is that uh, we, we, we're imbalanced usually. We either are on one end uh, seeing Satan everywhere or not seeing him at all. So we want to we wanna be wise, we want to be biblical in that respect. Satan hindered us. The word for hindered means to cut in two or to hinder or to impede progress, obstruct or cause delays. Satan is a fallen cherub according to the Bible. He is mighty and powerful, but he is not omnipresent. He cannot be in all places at all times. That's an attribute of God alone. So You'd think, where, will, where would we find Satan in A.D. 50? That's around the time when this, this epistle was written. Where, probably with, uh, somewhere in Caesar's household. Probably you know, with those great men of the, of the age. Those rulers whispering something in their ears. Well, not so according to Paul. According to Paul, he was there obstructing a Jewish tent maker from going back to Thessalonica so that he tells other people about a Jewish Messiah, about a Jewish carpenter who was the Messiah. 
You see, if that doesn't give credibility to Paul's ministry, I don't know what does. And it's, it's uh, no wonder then that, you remember those Jewish exorcists who were uh, going around and uh, casting out demons in the name of Jesus uh, in Ephesus? One time they, they said, well, you know, depart from the man in, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demon one time answered them from, from within the man saying, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know of, those are two different words, but who are you? Who are you? <laughs> to, who are you to use that name? Who are you to tell me about Paul? I mean, that, that's very interesting. The day the demons within the man knew about Paul, isn't that interesting? Isn't that what you want in a way? To be dangerous in the spiritual world like Paul was? To be on Satan's most wanted list? I'm sometimes afraid that uh, he doesn't take us very seriously. And if the world has, you know, is just ignoring the church and uh, can just uh, uh, do whatever it, it wants without even thinking about what the church says, I mean, that doesn't speak well of the church. There's something not right with the church. I will remind you that it was 120 spirit-filled believers that later on in uh, what we read in Acts 17, turned the world upside down. All of the Roman Empire knew about this Jesus. And it, it had already affected the way the Roman Empire worked because of this message that has been received in all those different places. 120 spirit-filled believers on the day of Pentecost. We can fit 120 people in this room. You can probably, you know, there will even be spare chairs maybe. So it doesn't take much if God is in it. So the hindrances, time and again, were consistent and relentless. But so were Paul's attempts. He didn't just give up. He didn't just say, well, okay, well, if the devil is hindering us, then no point. No, he was, isn't it interesting? He recognized that Satan was behind this, and he kept on pressing on, pressing in, trying to get back to them. Time and again, time and again. And when this didn't work, he looked for other ways. He looked, okay, well, if he's not letting us go, let's, let's figure out a, another way. Let's, let's, uh, let's work around it. Okay, Timothy, you go. Go there. So they they must, must be helped at all costs, those young believers there in Thessalonica. And, and you know what? I'm going to write a letter as well later on, he says. And, and he doesn't end there. In, in chapter 3, he goes on to say that we, we are still hoping to come to you. <laughs> so he doesn't just give up because Satan is trying to hinder him. So how do you, and, and you have to appreciate that. He really felt like, a, it's Mother's Day, right? So he really felt like a spiritual mother to them. Which mother among you will know that her children or her child was taken away from her without, you know, her, you know, beyond her, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't her, you know, doing. It was someone else did it, did it and, and she, she had no say in the, the whole thing. And she was taken away. The child was snatched away. And now she's trying to get back to the child. She wouldn't care if the whole world was against her or if the devil was against her. She was be trying to get back to the child at all costs. And that's how Paul felt. That's how Paul felt with those believers. So someone might ask, well, how do you know if... if uh, What's happening is a hindrance by Satan or something that the Holy Spirit is preventing. Remember, there was an occasion in Acts 16 when the Holy Spirit prevented them from doing certain things. They want to go into Asia. The Holy Spirit said no. They want to go to Bithynia. The Holy Spirit said no. And that's how it's recorded. I mean, uh, Acts 16. And uh, by the way, if... Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit was redirecting them to Europe, to Macedonia. And I believe that uh, if that hadn't happened, the history of the world would look very different, to say the least. But, so, how, how do we know which is which? Well, sometimes you might say, well, one of, them, one of those was simply the Holy Spirit, Spirit redirecting them. He wasn't stopping them from preaching the gospel. He was redirecting, he was channeling them. Whilst this was an obstruction, there was no alternative. It, it was a... It was a like a hard uh, obstruction that they couldn't overcome. So they attributed that to Satan because they know that, that Christ would have them preach the gospel. The Spirit of God would have them preach the gospel, even if he has to change their plans sometimes. But, you know, that, that's one explanation. But a, a better explanation is sometimes to, you only see things in hindsight. 
You know, so you only see things in hindsight. And so, yes, they might have seen that that was the work of the devil, but actually it could have been that God allowed that. I mean, it, God did allow it, but it might have been that God allowed it for a greater purpose, which he always does. By the way, what would have not happened if Paul and Silas were not, were not hindered by Satan? You wouldn't have First Thessalonians in your Bibles. Paul wouldn't have written that letter because he would be there. He would be there with them. He would be telling them all about, uh, about uh, uh, those things that he wrote to them about. So, it's not, you know, Satan meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In James uh, 5.11 we read, You have heard of the perseverance of Job. Really? Have you heard of the perseverance of Job? This man that lived thousands of years ago? How did you hear about it? You heard about it because you read about it over here in this book of Job. And how would you know about Job's patience or his perseverance if he wasn't tested? If God did not allow Satan to touch him, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that Job existed. But in fact, God made Satan touch him. Remember? Have you considered my servant Job? It wasn't that the devil brought him up. It, God brought him up. And the devil said, well, he's like that only because you've, uh, you've spoiled him. You've, you've surrounded him with all sorts of goods and uh, blessings. And, you know. and God says, okay, take those blessings away from him and see what he does. And so you, you get the point. You know about Job because God allowed some, some conflict to happen there. God allowed his faith to be tested. And, and yes, this was more than, yes, this accomplished something. This accomplished that his faith was, faith was tested and, and even purified, Job's was. But countless of believers after Job have been strengthened through the story of Job. Satan meant it for evil. He wanted to see Job fail miserably, curse God and die, just as Job's wife told him to do. But in, instead of doing that, Job emerged on the other side, triumphant in, 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 in Christ, really. And, uh, and many have been strengthened through this story. And that's why God did it. We don't always know, understand why God allows certain things, right? But we know that for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. It is like the, 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 the pers early church and the persecutions. What did the persecutions do in the early church? Well, they caused some, some turmoil, that's for sure. But they also spread the gospel. It's almost as if, you know, the devil's trying to throw a bucket of cold water on, on, the, on, the, on the fire of the gospel. And God turns the, the water of, in the bucket into oil in, before it reaches the fire. And instead of quenching the fire, it spreads it even further. That's what God, God does. And uh, he often uses Satan's devices against him. I mean, the, the ultimate example of that is the death of death in the death of Christ. Death by dying slew, as the hymn writer says. He killed death by dying. The sinless man died. The wages of sin is death. He did not deserve that death. Death could not hold him. And yes, he paid for our sins on the cross. And then by going into death, death could not hold its prey, and uh, therefore he was, uh, he was not only released from death, he, he consumed it, he killed death, and in the last day, he will, have, he, will, he will destroy death ultimately, once and for all, cast it into the lake of fire, no more to be mentioned amongst his people again. So then we read, for verses 19 and 20, for what is our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. What a rhetorical question he, he asks. Is it not, he says, what, what is our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing? And now any one of those Thessalonians might have thought, well, who knows? But he, what, what he means is, it's you, it's you. Believers, young believers, weak believers, it's you. And I want to make two observations here in those verses. The first observation is that the believer's reward is linked to his faithfulness. The believer's reward is linked to his or her faithfulness. 
in contrast to the accusations that were brought against Paul and Silas and, and the rest of the company uh, that he responded to in the first 12 verses of chapter 2, he says to them now, and he reminds them again, we weren't there for your money, we weren't there for man's praises, we weren't there for carnal pleasure, we weren't after what you have, we, weren't, we were there for you. We wanted you, not yours. You are our glory and joy. Th that is the evidence of the faithfulness, of the faithfulness of the, of the apostles there. He, as it were, he says, it is sufficient for us on that great day when Christ appears again and all his saints with him, it is sufficient for us to see you among them. It is sufficient for us to see you in, in a glorious garment. It is sufficient for us to see that we have passed from death to life because, of, because God used us to share the, me, the gospel message with you and you believed it. That's sufficient for us. That's a crown for us. That's, a, that's our reward. And you, you can imagine that the two are linked, by the way. Both a reward and seeing someone that you invested in and loved and wanted to see there in the presence of, of the Lord Jesus. Seeing them there, that's a, that's a double reward. What a joy. It's as if he says, this is, this is, you know, this is our righteousness. This is our crown. This is our exceeding great, exceedingly great reward. Proverbs 11. I'll remind you what it says. Verse 30. He who wins souls is wise. Daniel 12 verse 3 says, The wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There is a kind of reward there by bringing others along. Remember like Luke 16 tells you, make friends with, with your money, make friends with your resources, make eternal friends so that they can welcome you when you get there. And then the second observation from this, uh, those uh, last two verses is that Satan, in effect, wants to deprive you of your crown. Isn't that what he's trying to do? He's trying to stop them from going there. He's trying to tempt, the, the tempter is trying to tempt them out of their faith or whatever, you know, destroy that young church there. And by the way, he, if he can't stop you from going to heaven, he will make sure, he will, he will do everything within his power so that you get there crownless. You get there, you get to heaven crownless. You've got nothing. I mean, that's what, that's what he wants, right? He's the enemy. He'll hinder your usefulness in God's kingdom to such an extent that you're consumed with yourself and not, for, not with piling treasure in heaven. He'll try to tempt you out of your faithfulness. He'll attempt to suffocate you with the cares and problems of life so that you have no time to think about those things that really matter. He'll do his best or his worst to ensure that you, are, you live an embarrassingly self-centered Christian life. That you might have nothing in that great day to cast before the throne of your Savior. That's what he wants. He doesn't want Jesus to be praised. He doesn't want Jesus to be rewarded, given more praises from his people. And that's exactly what they will do. That's what, exactly what you will do on that great day when you are rewarded for your faithfulness and you cast your crowns before him. And that's not a foreign concept to Scripture, by the way. Re Revelation 3.11 tells us that, you know, the Lord Jesus tells the, the church in Philadelphia, remember? He says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no man may seize your crown. There is a thief amongst us. There is one who is trying to take your crown away. There's one who wants to rob you from your reward. If he can't get you to, to not make it to heaven, he'll try to get you to lose out. Do you know Moses? Moses, the meekest man, endured the most rebellious people leading them through the wilderness for 40 years. And this meekest man, supposed, supposed to lead them into the promised land, missed out on that. Why? Because on one, just another occasion when they were, they were murmuring and grumbling and everything that they were doing, those Israelites, they were wanting water again. And God told him to sanctify his name before the people 
and to speak to the rock the second time, remember? But instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it with his staff. The water gushed out, the people were happy, but God said, you didn't sanctify me before the people, and therefore you're not going to make it. You're not going to enter my promised land. Moses missed out on, on this reward, as it were. He missed out in his usefulness because he was because of this one occasion when he snapped at, at the Israelites, he missed out. Sin has consequences. And uh, don't, I know Satan is not mentioned in that passage, but don't think that the ancient foe is not somewhere in, in, in the back, you know, doing all of that, instigating all of that rebellion again from those rebellious people. So don't be like, like Moses. You have to keep your guard up till the very end. Otherwise, you can be so close and, and miss out on usefulness. God would have used you for something even greater and, and some greater cause in his kingdom. And then you, you miss out because Satan, the tempter, managed to tempt you in one way or another. Brethren, let us not be unbalanced. This is not so that I, I'm not saying all of this so that you start fearing the devil or you start kind of you were glorifying him beyond what, what he should be, uh, you know, or exalting him in some way by speaking about him too much, overemphasizing. You know, that would be wrong. So we, I don't want to be unbalanced. Jesus crushed the serpent's head on the cross. He is a defeated foe. All power in heaven and on earth is given to who? To Jesus, yes, not to the devil. And for the last 2,000 years, the God of peace has been in the business of crushing Satan under the feet of weak saints, like he says there in Romans 16, 20. We are not to fear him, this, this ancient foe, Satan, but rather stand against, his, uh, stand against his schemes after putting on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11. We are not to flee from him, but rather to make him flee by resisting him. James 4, 7. We are not to be ignorant of his devices, that, that's the third thing, but rather to anticipate them and counteract them. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. See, as I was saying earlier, Paul wasn't discouraged by all the, the satanic hindrances. On the contrary, he was looking for a way around them. He wasn't just giving up, and, and that's how we should be. This is warfare. You don't just give up when the enemy shows up. He is described. I mean, on the other hand, you can be unbalanced in the other direction, right? So you can think too little of him. He's a real enemy. He's described in the Bible as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 8. By, by the way, that verse begins with the following words Be sober and vigilant, which ought to tell you something. Perhaps that he won't devour you. You won't be one of his victims if you're sober and vigilant. All this is to say that we have a great enemy and uh, that we are at war with him. He has come down to earth, as the scripture says, having great wrath because he knows he has a short time, Revelation 12, 12. You're engaged in spiritual warfare, in this holy battle, and you cannot be exempt from the fight. There's no conscientious objectors in this war, brethren. There are another two extremes, and I'm going to end with that, to watch out for. Ascribing every frustration, as I mentioned earlier, of your plans to Satan. Sometimes he doesn't even need to get involved. Isn't that right? I mean, we, we some Christians, they, out of, I don't know, laziness or just easily being easily discouraged, they prevent themselves from doing God's will. The devil doesn't need to step in into the picture. Uh, their, their own faithlessness, perhaps, or sinful apathy are causing them to be hindered from doing the right thing. So don't think of yourself too highly. Oh, you know, like uh, Satan is against me now. Uh, maybe Satan doesn't even know who you are. Maybe he'll, he, one of his minions would be able to say, but who are you? Paul, we know, but who, we know about, but who are you? So don't think too highly of yourself. <clears throat> He opposes uh, believers, but he opposes some believers more than others. And it's based on their youthfulness and based on, he, on the danger that they, 
they present to his own kingdom. Some oppose themselves through their own unbelief or like to just over sensationalize uh, their Christian life. Everything is the devil. Every, everything that goes against uh, their plans is, is because of him. They blame him for everything. Well, maybe they didn't, you know, they didn't get it, make it to church in time or, you know, whatever, and it, it was the devil. <laughs> maybe it was, maybe it was that you overslept because you stayed late last night and <laughs> whatever. It was, it, it, don't blame the devil for everything. So that's, that's one of, of those uh, extremes. But on the flip side of that, there are some who are practically, as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, they're practically disbelieving that the devil exists. They, they might say that he exists because he's in the pages of Scripture, but he, they don't imagine that he's and, you know, in any way, shape, or form engaged in preventing the spread of the gospel in these days. Now, that's unbelievable to them. They're practical materialists, those people are. They like to rationalize everything, find explanations to every frustration within physical reasons, and uh, look for pragmatic solutions. So we don't want to be like that, brethren. So all I'm saying is, be neither. Be neither that nor that. Be balanced, be biblical, be vigilant, be sober, be steadfast, be watchful, be spiritually sensitive, supernaturally conscious. Conscious of the supernatural. You live in a supernatural world. And it's beyond the natural. Yes, there is the nature and the natural, but there is something that's beyond the natural. That's the spiritual world. And you have a spirit. You have to be like that. You have to understand those things, Christians. Out of all people, we need to know those things. Be heavenly minded. Be re relentlessly persistent, just like Paul was. The devil stopping me, I'm not going to stop trying to get back to Thessalonica because those young Christians there need me. So just be, be like that. You are, you're at war with him. You don't just yield to his desires. Remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Remember that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Remember that that's what we are engaged in, spiritual warfare. And Satan hindered Paul. Be sure that Satan will try to hinder Paul's, you know, the message that God used through Paul even in our day and age, the gospel. He will try to hinder it at all costs because he hates it. He hates Christ, he hates his people, and he hates his gospel. And we are here. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. And uh, that's why let us be sober, let us be vigilant, let us not fall asleep as others do, and let us uh, press on till the end, not drop our guards. Father, please help us to do all those things. Help us because we know that there is an enemy out there. Help us not to fear him, but rather to fight him. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're visiting with us, please stay around. We've got some refreshments at the back. You're dismissed.